Good morning and welcome to worship with Fifth Avenue Baptist Church. We are glad that you have tuned in on this Monday morning as we do more of an adaptive style bringing you the message this morning. I have a few announcements that I would like to give. Uh, this Wednesday is the church business meeting. Uh, the commissions will plan to have their um, schedules and calendars out for us. We do need 50 people to be here to make quorum. So if you don't have anything else to do on Wednesday, we would love for you to come out and be with us and get an update on where our church family is going. If you haven't marked your calendars yet, go ahead and mark them for February 8th. We are going to have a Valentine's Day uh, table decorating competition, and it's going to be accompanied with a very nice dinner, and, and in that competition, uh, you may get a gift, may win a prize. So go ahead and make sure that you mark your calendars for it. Today's scripture passage is going to be from Matthew 4, verses 12 to 23. Now, I know that in your worship guides, you may see 23, but um, we're going to go ahead and finish the chapter down to 25. It's only two extra verses, and I think we can handle that. So let us go to scripture. Starting in verse 12, now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and of Tali. So that when what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who dwell in the region of the shadow, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began preaching, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, on a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them. Immediately they left their boats and followed him. And he went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction amongst the people. So his fame spread throughout Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. The great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Diacopolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. The word of God for the people of God Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this word. Lord, as we lift it up to you and meditate on it, allow this time to fill us so that our cup may overflow with your love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, allow us to open up our minds, our bodies, our souls to be ready to receive from you what, we, what you have for us today. Let us read and hear these words anew, not so that we can just let it sit here and linger, but Lord, allow this message to energize us as a collective body to align ourselves to your mission here in Huntington. Lord, I pray that you set me aside that as these words come from our lips, that it is your voice that is heard today. Lord, allow me to decrease so that you may increase. Lord, may your Holy Spirit dwell in the homes of those who are watching. It is in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen.
Now, as you're sitting at home, I want you to repeat after me, and people may be uh, a little uh, weary of what you're about to do, but just repeat after me. Context matters. Say it again. Context matters. I have seen people make horrible decisions because they do not have the proper context. Context matters brings order. It's, it's, it, it brings about a sequence. It's how we sort things out uh, or how we sit back and watch how things play out. This is the reason why I find that the way that Matthew orders his gospel is very interesting. There's a sequence which gives context to each story after it. Here we've seen in chapters 1, 2, and 3, the birth, narrative, the birth narrative. And then last week we talked about the baptism of Jesus where the clouds opened up and God identified Jesus as being his only begotten son for whom he is well pleased. And then right before the section that, we covered this, that we're covering this morning, Jesus fasted and was tempted by God, I mean by Satan, in order that I believe gives direct reflection to the call in which we are called to when we are called to follow Christ. In this way, Matthew is identifying Christ not as some pie-in-the-sky deity who came to earth to dwell just for a season, but he shows Jesus' humanity within the context of his divinity as the son of God. So there is an order that brings context to where we are today. John baptized him. God identified him. And the devil, the devil tested him. But where we stand right now, it's time for Jesus to start his ministry. And in the sermon today, I hope that you walk with me as we discover Jesus' launch into ministry, his call for his disciples, and how Jesus demonstrates God's authority. Again here, there's an order and I don't want you to miss the order that gives context. And it's a small detail. But Matthew starts Jesus' full-time ministry just like God starts the birth narrative in a very strange place that may be looked over. But I will dare to say that there's a reason that God chose to begin the ministry in this area. This move to Capernaum wasn't by accident, nor was Jesus fleeing from somebody. The move to Galilee was strategic. So why would the king of the Jews move to a mostly Gentile area? I believe that it's so that Jesus could display both the character of God and the mission of God, so that Jesus can display the character of God in the mission of God. But one would ask, why Galilee? And the answer would be that Jesus could, in following his character of God, choose a place that nobody else would choose. See, Galilee was, was kind of riddled with Gentiles. It was a despised piece of land. It was economically poor. No one wanted to be there. That's where they sent the outcast. But then the question becomes, where would you find God? Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19 says this. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. 
Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You will find God amongst the homeless, the familyless, the broken, the outcast, the addicted, the persecuted. And that's where Jesus starts his ministry. And then Jesus going to this area also plays out the mission of God. Quoting in Isaiah, the Galilee of the Gentiles, Gentiles mean Galilee meaning nations, the people were living in darkness in this outcast area. See, Matthew was saying that the word of God being in the embodiment by Jesus was reaching to the nations, the, the Galilee of the Gentiles. It was going to all of the nations, a precursor for what he tells us in Matthew 28. The word will reach the nations. It's what God had promised Abraham. So it's a geographical location that has a theological implication. And it's exactly where God needed to be to start the transformation process of his people. Author and dean and ordained priest in the Church of England, Reverend Dr. Christopher Wright wrote, notes that three times in this particular passage, you see the phrase, and they followed him. The first being in verse 19 for Peter and Andrew. The second being in verse 22, James and John, the sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder. And again in verse 25, addressing the crowds. The same crowds can be seen following Jesus wherever he went throughout the book of Matthew. Matter of fact, Dr. Wright points out that these, this crowd followed Jesus wherever he went until they realized that Jesus was not going to fulfill this idea of an apocalyptic image of the Messiah where the Messiah, Jesus, overthrows the power, the government, and the authority of Rome by force. That by force is key. The same crowd that heard him on the mount and watched him do miracles and that ushered him from town to town, that, that same crowd was the crowd that shouted, we don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Also shouting, crucify him, crucify Jesus. It's then and only then that we realize that Jesus had a lot of followers, but didn't have many disciples. Dr. Wright goes on to, to know that there's three areas where being a radical disciple of Jesus is extremely challenging. And I want you to hear this this morning. He starts by saying, it was culturally surprising. It was culturally surprising because rabbis in that time did not choose their own disciples. The disciples would go out and they would kind of form fit their own rabbi and they would ask the rabbi that they would like, that they would pick, that fits them. Jesus constantly reminds the disciples that you didn't choose me, I chose you. And he didn't pick the cream of the crop, but he picked normal working tradesmen and then use their skills to demonstrate and work out what it means to be a disciple and how to disciple. It's kind of like what God did when he used Moses and David, these shepherds, to then shepherd large groups of people. So the fisher 
of people, of humanity, is an essence meaning that you will help me gather Israel back into the arms of God. Just as you cast your net and you gather the fish so that you will cast the word of God and you would gather his people. The second one was, it was economically costly. It was economically costly. Now these fishermen weren't just, they weren't peasants. The fishing business was that, it was a business. It was a very lucrative business. See, the fish, though they would be eaten, were more often dried than salted or pickled or broken down and, and traded and, and sold across the country. The scales would go together to make oil for lamps. This was a business. And the fish, fishing business was a good business to be in. But you have to think about what these disciples had to leave in order to do so. They left their financial means and picked the place where the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head. There was no set house for them to sleep in. They chose to follow him, leaving everything. And then Dr. Wright says, it's socially scandalous. Not only did they leave their jobs, but they left their father, meaning that they also left their families, their, their wives, their children. And at that time, the male of the household was the money maker, the breadwinner. Everything hinged on him. And, and for the sons of Zebedee, uh, James and John, you would think that they were next in line to take over the family business so they knew all the details of how to make this boat work or how to fish as they're training their teams. This company was being passed down and yet they left that. On a more deeper note, they left people that loved them and, and depended on them. And this was extremely taboo for that time. Now I am no way abdicating that Jesus is calling us to leave our families, but I do wanna speak truth to the fact that I have seen uh, pastor friends who, who sacrificed their family and their family's time for the quote unquote sake of the gospel or the sake of, uh, of the kingdom. You have to really evaluate at that point, which kingdom are you really chasing? Is it the kingdom where the world says you have to grind, 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 you have to get some grit, you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps in, in order to succeed, to be successful? Or is it the kingdom that is calling you to align with the will of God? And if it's the one that's calling you to align to the will of God, then we have to trust that God is going to create in us who God wants us to be, to bring forth this kind of imago day in our own spirits. And oftentimes that calls for us to sacrifice our love and our wants. But often, more oftentimes, it calls for us to throw some fertilizer on the relationships in our lives to help them grow, to help them flourish. That's the kingdom that should come first. The one that's about loving God and loving those around us. American evangelical Baptist pastor, David Platt wrote a book called radical and it based it on the premise that we must be radical in our pursuit of Christ that as we grow closer to Christ we do so in a manner that is calling us to grow closer to one another in his book he describes that true discipleship 
calls for us to be radical in five areas. And I'm going to give you those five areas for you to write down. But before I do that, I want to make it clear on the difference between radical discipleship and discipling radically. There's an extreme difference. And we as the church often get them mixed up. Discipling radically usually is found when one person is forcibly calling on another person to assimilate to be just like them under the disguise of love. If you love me, then you would do this for me. You must do this or that in order to fit in. And for the church, this idea of fitting in becomes a very dangerous game. Actually, we see more de-church groups. These are groups who had some affiliation with the church at some point in their past, and because of some hurt, choose not to go back to the church. Then we see unchurched people, people who have never heard the gospel, people who have, who have never been or stepped foot in the church. Then on the other hand, you don't have to look very far outside of this community to notice that someone isn't a part of this fellowship anymore because they decided that their feelings got hurt because the church didn't conform to their world view or fit in the box that they wanted or thought it should be under. The divisive spirit that is permeating the church in today's culture is quite frankly killing the church. I'm gonna say that again. The divisive spirit that is infiltrating and permeating in today's church, in today's culture, is quite frankly killing the church. And I'm here today to tell you that it has to stop. The attitude of it's my way or it's no way and I'm going to do it this way and if you like it, I'm going to just, if you don't like it, then I'm just going to move on from you. It's a way that we hold the church hostage. Now look at me. I love you and I mean it. And I hope you hear this with sincerity. But the truth is, it's not about you. It's not about you controlling what other people do or how they worship or how they serve or what missions we do or don't do. Because at the heart, at the heart of discipling radically, it calls for a contortion and mixing up of the scriptures to fit our own wants and desires. And if you don't fit the bill, then there's no place for you here that only leaves broken hearts and lost souls and unforgiving and unrepentant people who are also created in the image of God. Now, on the other side of the spectrum, we have radical discipleship. And this calls for us in five different areas to be about Christ and his business. Area number one, we must be willing to, to have this radical abandonment for the glory of Christ. There are things that we must give up. The needs, our wants, Sometimes it calls for our jobs. Sometimes it means that we need to separate from negative people, even if that negative person is within your family. I don't know what it is for you, but it calls for us to abandon those things in order for the glory of God. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that they have to abandon things that are, are necessarily bad because there are things that you have to abandon that is good. If we look at the scriptures, it said that they were fishermen, their job. 
But then God used that. He used what he blessed you with, not for your glory, but for the glory of God and to bring about his kingdom. We have to be willing to allow God to use us in every area of our lives. So we must abandon the idea that I want it my way, how I want it my way, and I know what is best for us for the idea that, 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 that God who predestined our path has our best interest in mind. Who knows us? Who knows our deepest, darkest secrets? That God has a plan for us. The plan to use what he has blessed us with to further his kingdom. Number two, we have to have a radical dependency on the grace of Christ. In the passage it says, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of man. Ezekiel 36 says it like this, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and to be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in a land that I give you and to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your God. I found that grace works best when people have to depend on it. Often I see people who have hardened hearts who usually believe that they are not about to struggle and, 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 and they have zero struggle in their life and they can do it on their own. They don't need God. I have money to supply my every need. But what happens when God takes away the money? Where do you lean now? Who do you go to? The question is, can you be a follower, a disciple of Christ when things go awry, when things go horrible, when you're down and out? I often find that people are searching for God's grace whenever they're in the valley moments. Very rarely do people give praise to God whenever they're on the mountaintop because oftentimes they believe that they themselves got themselves to the mountaintop and they don't give anybody any appreciation because they did it. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. And what I'm saying today is that In the valleys, we must also give praise there, but we have to give the same amount of praise when we're on the mountaintops, when things are going okay for us. When we're up there on the mountaintop, we must also continue to seek the grace of God in a radical fashion. And then there's radical adherence to the person of Christ. The radical adherence to the person of Christ. It's imitating Jesus to learn to act like, to talk like, to think like Jesus. In those times, the disciples wanted to be just like their rabbis. That's the reason why they would search out and seek rabbis that often fit their lifestyle. As Christians, we're called to walk like Jesus. Remember, it was countercultural for a rabbi to pick his own disciples, and yet Jesus picks these 
people to transform the world. And scripture also tells us that God picks you and I to be people who transforms the world for the kingdom's sake. Are you chasing after God in order to be in his likeness, to, to be like him, to, in a real sense, be a Christian, a little Christ? Are you willing to adhere to the likeness of Christ? And then we have to radically trust in the authority of Christ, trusting Jesus with our future. Scripture says that they immediately left their boat and their fathers behind and followed him. They left everything for Jesus, to follow Jesus, the glory, the money, the fame, the family, the recognition, the safety, the security, everything to follow Christ. We have a real trust issue in our world. Matter of fact, we want to hoard all the things that we find that is ours and not disperse them amongst others, even though we see them in need. I would dare to say that our gifts are not a gift out of True sincerity, but I would dare to say that we refuse to give because we don't trust the process. Trusting in the process. Are we willing to have radical trust in the authority of Christ? Not Reverend Vaughn's authority, not Fifth Avenue Baptist's authority, but the authority of the God who's bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. Are you willing to align with your trust to that authority? And then we have to have radical obedience to the mission of Christ. Radical obedience to the mission of Christ. They became fishers of men, or, or, or some translations say they became fishers of people. The goal is to make disciples, to share the word of Christ. The Great Commission in Matthew 28, 16 through 20 says this, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Pause right there. Some people still doubt, even though they see Jesus right in front of them. Let's continue in verse 18. And Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. One thing that I do want to point out here that, that you can see all five radical statements found in the Great Commission. Number one being the radical abandonment. Go to all the nations. Leave behind the life that you thought that you wanted for the life that I have created you for. You must be willing to leave that life to follow the life that Christ is leading you to. Number two, radical dependency. Jesus is the one who's going to help us make disciples. When we start to make disciples that look like us, then we're creating a cult. But when we start to make disciples that look like Jesus, when we assist in the Holy Spirit 
going into the heart of people that look like Jesus created in the Imago Dei, then it's not I who is lifted up, but Christ who is lifted up. A radical dependency calls for us to rest in the arms of Christ. In the Great Commission, it says that I am with you always to the end of the age to depend on Christ and Christ's work within us and Christ's work through us. And then there's radical adherence, baptizing, showing our loyalty to Jesus Christ as Jesus Christ both in his baptism and in his burial and resurrection was was laid down to death to be risen into a new life. Are we willing to adhere to that? To baptize and to teach, trying to teach the understanding of Christ, to walk with, to journey with, our peers and our church family around us as you're navigating life, as you try to reflect on the words and actions of Jesus. And then there's radical trust. All authority on he- on, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Can we trust that Jesus has all the authority? And it was given unto him from God who created everything. And that same God who created everything is calling us to discipleship. Discipleship that is radical to himself. And God can make disciples through disciples. And the last one is radical obedience. Go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. Now the thing is, we often miss this small detail when it says, this this small command when it says, go and make disciples. Because most people just stop with the go part. And very rarely do they make disciples. In the original language, in the Greek and Hebrew, this go doesn't mean that we have to send you to a special place. We don't have to send you to a foreign land for you to make disciples. The connotation here is that when you go, as you go, you will make disciples. As you go through life, you will make disciples. As you journey through this world, as you traverse the terrain that is set before you, you will make disciples. Making disciples is the, go- is the goal, not necessarily going. Then finally, we get down to verses 23 to 25. And I fully believe it's Jesus demonstrating the mission of God in both word and deed. Because we've seen in in its context the birth narrative, the baptism, the identifier of the begotten son, the testing in the wilderness, and then the call to put all those into action. So in these verses, in a very real sense, he is living out what it would be to be the kingdom of God here on earth by teaching and healing people. It's good news because God reigns. It's good news because people are saved. It's good news because people are forgiven and are accepted and are brought in. And again, I remind you, These were not the Jewish people. These were Gentiles on the outside. Jesus was giving us a precursor for his command found in Matthew 28 to go to all the nations. Demonstrating God's will 
in both word and action. This upcoming week, you will hear from Reverend Dr. Guy Sells, mostly on the Sermon on the Mount. And in this section, you will hear Jesus describing what it means to be at the feet of God and focusing on the kingdom of God, what it would be like for you to reach those things. He's giving us a game plan on the Sermon on the Mount of how to bring about the kingdom of God in the way that he has done it. Now this sermon was titled with a sermon title, What's the Risk? What's the risk of discipling and being discipled? The answer to that is everything. In order to be a radical disciple of God, you got to risk everything. In order to delineate between uh, being a follower, just a follower in the crowd, or being a true disciple, you have to give everything. You have to risk everything. The question is now, are you willing to risk it? Let's pray. God, we thank you for being a God of order, to flow from the beginning to the end, because you are Alpha and Omega. Lord, we thank you for calling us into your likeness. We thank you for demonstrating what it means to live the kingdom of heaven here on earth. God, be with us as we align ourselves to walk in your will. Walk with us. Be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. God, if there's anyone sitting at home who has felt the press of God calling them to surrender their lives over to you, Lord, we ask that you bring them about, that you work good works within them, that the Holy Spirit convicts in a way to show that they are loved beyond all measure. Lord, we thank you. We praise your name. Amen. Looking forward to worshiping with you again next week. You have a blessed day.